Um, this is a tough one. The role of women in church. Aren't you glad you came? Man, the role of women in church. <laughs> Woo! Um, this is a highly debated topic in the body of Christ. It is deba- it's been debated for centuries. It has been debated for centuries, and I believe it will be debated until Jesus returns. So who wins? I, I-, I think we got to quit when it comes to figuring out who wins. I... Um, you can go ahead and turn. You know where we're going, some of you. Uh, um, 1 Corinthians 14, and second, or 1 Timothy chapter 2. So let's just go there. Y'all ready to go there? Um, on, on, on July the 4th, if you'll just do something, just hold on to those. You don't need to um, read those right now. Just kind of hang on to them and, and um, put those aside, and, and we'll go through this and Um, that's just kind of a a summation, but, um, before I get started, I want to tell you a story. Um, let's just just begin with this story. So I want to tell you a story about a young man, um, a young man who grew up in church, never, never knew a time, never knew a season where he did not go to church. Grew up knowing the Bible. Grew up in a le- kind of a legalistic system. Knew the Bible. Knew the Bible very, 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 very well. Was an argumentative person. In fact, came, came by that honestly because this young person's father was very argumentative and very opinionated. And this young man grew up with this, this identity of, of being a debater and knowing the word of God frontwards and backwards. This young man put himself on a pedestal and judged people, was ready to argue at a moment's notice, would debate anybody, go toe-to-toe with anybody. Young, old, did not matter. Just didn't matter. Leaders in the church, it didn't matter. Prideful, arrogant Pharisee. Saul of Tarsus kind of a person. That's who this person was like. Didn't walk around killing other people literally, but did a great job verbally. Then he had an encounter with the Creator. He had an encounter with the God that created him. The God he was so confident that he knew. And in a moment realized he didn't know him at all. The young man was me. I did no one in the body of Christ any good. But I knew scripture. And I used it to hurt and wound. I used it to put myself on a pedestal over everybody else. Because what I knew was right and they were all wrong. And that day, in my bedroom, I heard the Lord begin to speak. 
And I was confident I never knew him. Oh, I knew about him. But I didn't know him. I didn't know his heart. I didn't know his character. I went to church every Sunday and, didn't, and never missed. I was involved in ministry. Every area of ministry I could put myself into. And I didn't know the, I didn't know the one I was serving. What's it all for? What is it all for to know, to know it all, but not know the author? That person died that day. He no longer exists. I don't debate. I refuse to debate. I'm not here to debate scripture. I will not taint the pulpit and diminish it to a debate forum. It is to speak the oracles of God. I am not here to prove a point and to stand on a soapbox. Those of you that are visiting, I apologize. I apologize for doing family business in front of you. Who wins? I'll tell you who wins. The enemy wins. The enemy wins with the debate. Because all he wants to do is divide and conquer. To cause division in the church. I started just to play my message on unity that I preached several months ago. I just, I, th- I, read, I, I watched it this week and I thought, dear God, what the heck are we doing? Some of you were just offended that I said heck. And some of you are offended that I didn't say the other one. Because that's how serious it is. I lost sleep this week. And it has nothing to do with this. You know why I lost sleep this week? Because there's a widow in the church. (laughs) Oh. I hope you hear my heart this morning. There's a widow in this church that cannot pay rent. And I can't help her. What the heck's this for? That's right. I drove home the other day from work for 30 minutes. I wept. I wept because there's lost all around us. And we want to debate whether or not it's okay for a woman under submission to her husband, under submission to the church leadership, under submission to God, who submits her notes to leadership before she speaks a word. We're here to debate whether or not she can have authority to speak to a Bible, a Bible class that has three or four men in it. I'll not defend my position. I'll not, I'm not here to defend it. I've got a mandate from, from heaven as to reach our community with the gospel. I can assure you there are multiple, there are multiple sides. Multiple. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We've got to read something. I hope you're hearing my heart. I'm broken. I am broken. In 25 years of ministry, nearly 25 years of ministry, I have been around this tree a bunch of times. A bunch. 
I've had to ask forgiveness. I've had to ask forgiveness from the Lord this week because I came ready to go toe-to-toe and to prove my point and to debate an issue that some have already made their mind up on. And it's okay. I don't care what side of the fence you fall on. I don't care. I love you. And I'll walk, I'll walk to hell and back with you. I, I just don't care. First Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 34. Here it is. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. There has to be a context. (laughs) Pardon, Pardon me. There has to be context here. Would everyone agree that there has to be context? Yes. Let, me, let, me, let me say this. Let me, okay, we, we can lighten up a little bit, okay? Um, um, there has to be context here. Because if there's not context, then every woman has to shut up the minute they walk in the church doors. Do you see that? Yes. So would everyone agree there's got to be context here? There's got to be something else Paul is telling us. There's got to be a reason why Paul would say this. There's got to be something else going on or Paul would not say this. Do you know that in the same letter that Paul gave the women permission to prophesy and pray in a public meeting? So then why would he tell them right after that? Why would he tell them Why would he tell them they can't speak? Either he's schizophrenic, which would mean he probably has a devil, or we're missing something in the translation. I don't think anyone thinks Paul's schizophrenic. I don't think anybody thinks he has a demon. So Paul's got to be saying something else or he's got to be alluding to a context that we don't understand. Let, let, me, let me say this. Let me say this. That P- Paul, I believe in Corinthians, is liberating women. He's liberating them. But th- th- for a second, think about who Paul is. Paul was was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a persecutor of women. The Romans kept women under thumb. The Pharisees even more so. Did you know in Jewish culture that a woman was not even a, a, a credible witness? Yet Jesus, when he raised from the dead... The witness, the first witness that saw him was Mary. And I don't know what you define as teach. But I got to think that when Jesus instructs Mary to go and tell the disciples, I have risen. Is that not teaching them something? But maybe we got to redefine what teach, well, what, what standard are we going to use there? The women were not told to be quiet in church. And that was to be unilaterally supposed to be used in all the churches. And we all know that. There's not a person here, I don't think. And if you do believe that, man, you must live miserably in church. Because there's not a church on the planet, maybe in the Middle East, there's not a church here where women can't speak. Let me tell you another story. When I was a teenager, I had a friend whose mom was from Iraq. And she had married an an oil man in America. And she had divorced him, or they had gotten divorced. And so this was my, my, one of my best friends growing up. 
He lived down the street from me. I was at his house, and, and, and his mom had relatives from Iraq in their house. And the men were sitting down eating dinner. And I'm just a teenager. And all of a sudden, this man jumps up from his chair. And he lays into this woman. I thought he's going to belt her. I thought he was going to hit this woman. He is all over her. And I just remember everything stopped. You could have heard a pin drop. And you look over and you're like, what in the world's going on? And you know what? The, you, you know, does anybody know what the offense was? She spoke while they were eating a meal. I couldn't believe it. I, I, I never, I, I couldn't believe that. Paul, Paul was a man as a Pharisee that, that ruled over women. And in Corinthians, did you know that in Corinthians, Paul, this is how liberating Paul was. Ryan, Paul said this. He said, as a wife, you don't have authority over your body. He does. Ryan, as a husband, you don't have authority over her body. I'm sorry, you don't have authority over your body. She does. That must have, been, that must have blown the Corinthians away. Why? Because that's Paul. That's Paul saying that. This is Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, who's liberating women in the Corinthian church. He says it's okay for them to prophesy. It just has to be in order. Let me say this. For anyone to prophesy, it has to be in order. I don't care if you're male or female. There is an order to this place. And you cannot just step up and do whatever you want to if you're not submitted to the authority in the house. And the authority in the house better be submitted to the authority in heaven. And if they're not, guess who's going to deal with them? God. So Paul, Paul, I, I, so, so we know Paul's not, so here's what we think. Um, I'm sorry. Here's what certain people think is that what's going on in the Corinthian church is that the women are sitting on one side, the men are sitting on the other side. The women are unlearned because they weren't allowed to be educated, but now they're, being, now they're allowed to be educated. And so during the middle of the service, they began to ask questions of their husbands. And their husbands were across the room. How many know that would be a huge distraction? If we all sat with the men on one side and the women on the other side, and the women asked questions of their husband over here while I was ministering, or anybody else was ministering, or somebody was prophesying, how many know that would be a huge distraction? What does he mean by that? How many know that's a valid point? How many think that that's a valid point? Okay, that's a valid point. Can we read this in the King James? Can we read this passage in the King James? Because I want to show you another valid point. I think this is as valid. Some, listen, there are multiple sides. There are multiple sides, and that's the point I want to make. What do you do when there's multiple sides to an issue? You love one another. When there's multiple sides, you love one another. If there was, listen, let's just be honest here. If, if someone came in here, now I don't know where you stand politically, but I'm going to throw this out there because I believe probably the majority of you stand on the conservative side. I may be wrong, but I think probably the majority of you stand on the conservative side. And some of you are probably struggling with who you're going to vote for because you're not you know, sure. So, so I, I, I think, I do believe, I, I think I'm okay with saying this. Now, now if, you, if you stand on this side, listen, there's no condemnation. You're making my point, okay? If there was somebody who stood up and after the election was over and they told you that they voted for Hillary and they're a member of this body, would you struggle to love them? And that's why God puts us together and he commands us to love one another. Can you just walk in unity? Can you just walk in unity, even if you don't agree? Can you, how many husbands have you ever wanted to do something and your wife did not agree with you? Anybody? Anybody? 
Yeah, this morning. Yeah, there you go. There you go. How do you walk in unity? How do you walk in unity when that happens? The boss gets his way? Well, I mean, that would be, that would be great. But, uh, but the deal is, you're, you don't have unity if there's not submission. You don't have unity if you don't have submission. Jesus in the garden, Father, let this cup pass from me. If it's not your will, if it's not your will, let, listen, it, let this cup pass from you. But if it's not your will, Father, I, I don't want what, I, I'm submitted to your authority. I don't want to go through with this. But Father, it's not my will, your will be done. What is that? That's submission to authority. Does anybody know what happened to Jesus as a result of him submitting to authority? Well, that's a great point. He did die. But then he was exalted and given the name above every name. Because you know why? In the kingdom of God, do you know, do you know how you get authority in the kingdom of God? Through submission. It's never been any other way, by the way. It's through submission. Let me, let me make a point to you. So God, because Jesus, Jesus submitted to him, has exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at his name every, every one must bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. That's how big and bad and awesome he is because he submitted to the, he submitted to the Father uh, and died on the cross. That, that's where submission got him. And then Jesus has, has caused us to sit up with him in heavenly places because the church is submitted to Jesus. Do you see where submission gets you? It doesn't get you lorded over. It gets you elevated and empowered. <clears throat> my job is not to keep my wife underfoot. She is a help me to me. And before you think that that's a subordinate term, that same term is used mostly in Scripture describing God. He is your help. Is he subordinate to you? No. So we have to be very careful with how we term and view things. Here, listen, well, let's, let's face it. When we look at Scripture, does anyone have a pair of lenses? Not, not literal. Does anybody have a filter that you look at through Scripture? I mean, we all do, by the way. We all do. We all, every single one of us. Sometimes it's our environment that has tainted us. Sometimes it's the church environment that we grew up in. Sometimes it's the house we grew up in. Sometimes it's our Father that affects the way we see our Heavenly Father. There are filters that we walk and we read scripture with. And what happens is we try, we, 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 when we read scripture, we want to filter everything. And listen, I'm no different. I'm no different. There are times when I have to put down the, the filter and say, God, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. I can't, I can't, I don't want, I don't want my filter to affect what I'm hearing from you. I need you to speak to me. That's how we approach scripture. What is it in me that taints what I'm hearing? We all hear and see with a filter. As we get to know the Father, guess what happens? The filter becomes clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. So we see things that we've never seen before. How many has seen things in Scripture and you believe things 15 years ago, but you do not believe the same thing today? You heard somebody preach something and you believed it and then you read and you found out something different. It's because we're all on a journey. What mile marker are you at? It may be different than somebody else. Can you still love them? <laughs> Did I say King James? Put the King James version up here because if you're a King James guy you, you, um, and, that's all, and that's really all you read, you're going to see this scripture very different. I mean, you're going to see it a lot. And this is what I want. I, we're, going to read, we're going to read on after uh, verse 35. Can we do that? Because the King James does something that no other translation does. This, I'm just, this is just another viewpoint. 
Can we go there? So, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. I wonder what the, that law is, because it's not, it's not the Old Testament law. And Paul would know that because Paul knows the law better than any of them. So, so is, it, is it a cultural law? I, I, I don't know, because it's a Corinthian church, and it's more liberated than the Jewish converts. They're, they're Greek. By the way, if you know Greek culture, the Greek women, the Greek women had an issue with authority. They were, they, were, they were like domineering women. They'd been given a place. They, did you know that Greeks really began to worship goddesses? And that they, they, they actually, there was, it was a, uh, there, there, was, there was a sect of them that actually believed that, that, uh, that the woman came first, not the man. But it's amazing. But, but, look, but look at this. So, so, so keep going. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. That must stink for a widow. But let's keep going on. For it is a... No, 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 no. Let me, let me I finish there. Let me, right. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? I, I, I read that according to grammar. What? Let me say this, that there are some that read this in the King James and they see Paul as doubting or, or, or seeing error in what was just said. What? Let's read it again. Go back, go back, go back. Let's read it again. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Keep going. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I wrote or I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. There's some that believe that Paul didn't write those two verses that told women to be silent. Why? Because in context, that sure looks like it. What? That's nonsense. Who told you that? Did God tell you that? Because I haven't heard that. Did God speak to you about this? Has he only spoken to you? Because I don't know of any other church that does that. Some of you are like, what, dude? I know. Uh -uh. I can't read. I can't comprehend that. I'm just saying there's another point. There's another side to this equation. Who's right? Those that read the Living Bible? The New King James? Because it doesn't say that in the New King James. What's amazing about the New King James is that that word what is a symbol. And throughout 1 Corinthians, the New King James does not translate it the same every single time. But the King James Version translates it what every single time. I don't, I, don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> My challenge is read 1 Corinthians in the King James Version. And every time you see what, say it like that. What? And then see what he says. Just sit, just do it. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying that some argue that point. Okay, we gotta go to first, we gotta go to first Timothy, because that's really the one. That's really the the one. First Timothy. Who's right? Well, I am. If you're right, raise your hand. I'm serious. If you're, if, you, if you're right, raise your hand. Nobody wants to raise their hand. Because um, here's the point. Here's the point. Is there are those that have studied this scripture out and you know why you believe what you believe. And let me say it. That's okay. Everyone needs conviction. Everyone needs conviction. But... Is it a divisive one? In other words, if you believe that there are many ways to the Father, that's, that we're going to divide on that one. If, 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 if you think, I, I was, we were talking about uh, baptism and, and, and we didn't know what, we, we got a big pool, by the way. We got a 12-foot pool and we put it in here. 
1,400 gallons of water. Uh, yeah, we decided not to put 1,400 gallons of water in it. So we took, we, we, we took the, we went and got this. And we were joking. I thought we were joking. And this one guy said, well, we, you could get, um, we have like a, a, like a camping shower. And um, that would at least, you know, sprinkle. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't think that's what we want to do. Um, why? Because that would be a divisive issue, right? Because the, the word baptism means to submerge. And we would have a divisive issue there. Um, there, there are things that, that, that are, are um, non-negotiables, and we need to stand firm on that. Um, listen, and if you struggle with a woman uh, teaching, that, that, there's, nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with your position. But here's the point is, can you honor? Can you still walk in honor? Let me, let me give you an example. So let me tell you another story about myself. I had two yelling arguments with my dad where I raised my voice at my dad twice in my life. Twice. He made me so mad. And I could not hold it in. And rage came out. Anybody been there? My dad got, made me so upset. And here's the point is scripturally, I could prove my point to be right. And if I, spoke, if I told you what the issue was right now, 99% of you would probably agree with me. And being right, I was wrong. Because I spoke to my father in a way that was out of bounds. I am only responsible for myself. I can only control myself. I can't control whether or not somebody else honors or respects me. But I can sure control whether or not I walk in honor or in respect towards, one, towards someone else. So in, 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 in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy um, chapter 2, did you know that... Um, um, Remember, there's context that we, re- that we read in, in, in Corinthians. There has to be context, right? Because we know that even though there might be some times when you would like for um, you know, people to be quiet, um, we, we can't use that scripture, right? Everybody understand that? Okay. Because there's context. So 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 15. Here it is. I'm sorry, not 15. No, no, let's read 15, because that's good. 15 is a good starting place. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. Let's read that again. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness, and self-control. Speaking of woman. Now, if, if there's not context to that scripture... That can really be a weird doctrine. Let's read it again. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness, and self-control. How many think that there must be context? How many think that a woman is saved by having a child? Is that what that scripture said, though? (laughs) So there has to be context. There has to be context or that is a horrible doctrine. I don't know. Maybe there's somebody that holds to that doctrine. I, I don't know. I've heard some pretty weird things. Anybody heard some pretty weird things? You know, bless God, you got to have a baby if you're going to be saved. I mean, I mean, that's not what it's saying. You know, think, you know, M- Melissa saved many times over. You know, you've got it. You got it taken care of. There has to be context. There has to be. Come on. You know, there has to be context. If there's not context, that is just weird. Let me, let me throw out something that might be the case. That it just might be the case. Ephesus. Does anybody know what temple's in Ephesus? Diana or Artemis? Quick Greek mythology lesson. Artemis was a twin. Her twin brother, she was a twin. Her twin brother was was born nine days after her. 
but they were twins. Talk about some bad labor. Nine days. Now, it all, listen, it, listen. I'm just, I'm just, here's a, here's a point. Here's a, this is an argument. So, so Artemis has a thing when it comes to child, to, to labor. She chooses never to get married. This is Greek mythology. She chooses never to get, you never thought you'd come to church and learn about Greek mythology. She, she, she goes into, so, so she, she doesn't get married. She stays, she stays um, um, single. And she is believed to help the Greek women through childbirth. I wonder how difficult it was to get a Greek woman in Ephesus saved if she thought that making Artemis mad would kill her or her baby during childbirth. Now let's read this passage. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. It's not salvation. It's preserved through childbirth. Why? Why? Does that sound like a sound argument? It sounds like a sound argument. It's not the only one. You, you want me to go to another one? I, there's just argument after argument here. Who wins? I, the enemy. When we, when we want to argue about it. Listen, it's not, there's nothing wrong with talking about it. There's nothing wrong with discussing it. There is a problem when division comes as a result of it. Jesus prayed a prayer before he left, and it was that they would all be one. Can you be one? Can you, can, I like the cowboys. Can you love me? And some of you are like, no way. <laughs> I mean, Jamie was shaking her head no, because she's a Texan fan. <laughs> I know that's funny, but it's the same point. It's the same point. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I mean, um, verse um, 11. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Again, is he saying we, women always have to say, well, we know that in 1 Corinthians that wasn't true. And also, this is, a, this is talking about a submitted woman. Listen, how many's ever seen a woman who's not submitted to her husband? And you knew something, it's not right. There's something, it's not right. They're out of order. Something's not right. They're out of order. This is talking about a woman who submitted, has a submitted heart. It's not a beat, it's not a beat down woman. This is a woman who loves her husband. I got to hurry because we got to do baptisms. And that's really important. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Again, silence, quiet, be in submission. Be in submission. Not, let, 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 can, we read the, can we read the King James again? Because it says something a little different. Let's, let's read it. And I do not permit, go ahead, can you put King James up there? Do you have it? Let your, let, um, no, 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 no. Um, um, okay, you, you don't have to put it up there. King James says this. The King James says this. I do not allow a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man. There is a huge difference between being given a position of authority and setting yourself up as authority. It is the sin of Lucifer, by the way. Lucifer said, I will exalt myself. That's out of bounds for a woman or a man. I will do it myself. The word that Paul uses for authority is never used in Scripture ever except right here. And it comes from a word to, that means to murder with my bare hands. It is an act of aggression, and it is me doing it myself. It is not. Does anybody know why Jesus didn't bow his knee um, to Satan when he offered him the world? Mm -hmm. 
because he understood that through the kingdom, the way you got, the way you you inherited, um, you inherited the nations was um, through submission to the Father. That's the way the kingdom works. You want authority in the kingdom? Submit. It's not an ugly thing. Submission. Did you know the husband and a wife and that whole submission thing? Do you know Jesus modeled that for us? It's not an ugly thing. He submitted to the Father. Was Jesus equal to the Father? Mm-hmm. Was Jesus equal to the Father? That's, that's a yes, okay? Yet he submitted to the Father. That's a beautiful thing. That's a powerful thing. So it's not ugly. It's not, you better submit, woman. You can get out of line. It's not like that. It's not the point. The point is that God wants us to walk in correct relationship with one another, and the husband is to lay down his life for his wife the way Christ laid down his life for the church. The wife is to submit unto the husband as under the Lord. That's a beautiful model for walking through life. Scripture tells, talks about the man being the head and the wife being... Um, does anybody, let, let, me, let me just... One more thing, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. One more thing. Does anybody know the curse that came on Eve? What, what was the curse that came on Eve? Okay, so... We, okay. 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 So... The, the, her desire will be for her husband and he will, and she will be ruled over by her husband, right? So that was the curse. That was the curse. I'm going to use you again, okay? Okay. So the curse was you would be ruled over by your husband. That's, that's the curse, okay? Because of the sin of Eve, okay? So, so if, if, if that's the case... Where in the world did we ever get to the point, if that was the curse, and we know it in the Hebrew, because the word for, for husband in the Hebrew is husband. It's not man, it's husband. How did we ever get from the curse, which was bad? The curse was bad. That's after the fall. How did we get from there to the fact that you're under my authority because I'm a male? How did we ever get there? It's not, that's not scriptural. That's not scriptural. You know why? Because I don't lay down my life for her. I'm not going to... That, that's his job. Oh, it got really quiet in here. We have to be very careful because the Greek word for man and, and man and husband's the same word. This passage of scripture... Another side of the argument could be, I don't allow a woman to teach or a wife to teach her husband or usurp authority over her husband because that's out of bounds. Who's right? <laughs> Who's right there? The one that says it's a man over a woman or the one that says it's a, it's a husband over a wife? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It does not matter how you see that. Can we walk in unity together? Can we walk in love? I think we can. So where do we stand as a church? Where do we stand? Um, I don't know if everybody got one, but there's a, we, we handed out a, a, a position paper where we stand. That's, that's kind of where we stand. Not kind of, that's where we stand. As, as leaders, that's where we stand collectively. Um, and let me say another thing is, did you know that in eldership, there are times when we disagree on things? But in order to be one, we walk out of, uh, we walk out of the room in agreement with one another. By the way, none of us disagreed on this. Nor does it our apostolic elders, because we, 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 uh, we appeal to them as well. I, here's, here's, what we, here's what we believe, and I'll just say it. That we believe if a woman is submitted to her husband and is submitted to the church leadership and is submitted to God, then she can, then she, listen, she can teach as long as she's been given that position to teach by church leadership. By the way, no one has ever taught, no woman has ever taught men 
where there was not an elder present. It's not happened. It's, it's never happened. And it won't. Why? Because we believe in covering. We believe in a covering. We be, when Julie, Julie came here from Ireland and shared her testimony, she did not do that without a covering. Her father was not here. She is not married. We were her covering. The church leadership was her covering. We're here to protect. We're here to empower. We're here, we're here to, um, 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 to make sure that, um, uh, that we judge everything that's said. Did you know that we do that? Did you know we judge prophecy? We judge it. Did you know that, that if I say something out of bounds, I will hear about it from the eldership? The, brother, uh, show me in scripture. Let's, let's talk about that. So I just, I just want to encourage you today that, that God, God can help us to walk together in unity wherever you stand on the issue. But it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It's, a, it's an issue. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's something small. I'm just saying whether it's big or large, we can walk in unity together and we can love one another and we can do what God's called us to do. We can, how many know God wants us to reach the lost? How many know that God wants us to take care of the widows and the orphans? I, that's, that's our mandate from heaven. We're, we're, we're here to take and, and, and we're here to, to, um, um, to heal the brokenhearted. And there's somebody here this morning, I believe, that's brokenhearted. And, and uh, we're not leaving here until we give you an opportunity um, to get healed. So I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. Those that are going to be baptized, go ahead and get ready. And I, and I, would, uh, I know it's, uh, uh, we're, we're a little over today, but I would encourage you to stay and be baptized. If, or not stay and be baptized. If you haven't been baptized, let's baptize you. But if, if, um, um, if you would stay and, and celebrate with us, we just have a, a, a few that are going to be baptized. It'll be really quick. And, um, um, and they're going to celebrate their freedom. And we get to celebrate their freedom with them. Amen? So if you're in this place this morning and you have... Um, 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 you're struggling. Just bottom line, you're struggling. I, I think there's somebody here that um, this morning that, um, um, that you don't know Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you right to bow your heads. And if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. Jesus is here to set you free. You heard us saying it about freedom. Jesus is here to set you free. So if that's you, I'm going to just raise your hand. Raise it high so I can see it. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just say, I don't, I've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior. I don't even know what that means. Raise your hand. Anybody? All right. If you have a need this morning, I'm going to ask you to step out. Don't hesitate. Just go ahead and step out if you have a need this morning, because we're about to transition and baptize. But we'll give you an opportunity if you have a need this morning. We'll, we'll give you an opportunity to come up here and we're going to pray with you as, as we get set to baptize these. So whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Financial, physical, emotional, does not matter. They're here to pray with you. They're here to, to love you and to pray with you.